Welcome to the Stepping Out of Poverty and Into Opportunity Symposium. We are certainly so glad that all of you decided to come out tonight. Uh, my name is Priscilla Taylor, and I'm the mayor of Palm Beach County, who is just pitch hitting right now. My, my place hasn't started yet, but I'm here uh, so that we can get the program moving. We will now have the Pledge of Allegiance by Brian Edwards, um, for Executive Director of the Goodwill. Thank you very much, Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and join me. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We will now call up Reverend Verona Matthews for the invocation. Good afternoon. Let us pray. Father God, we are always so thankful for each and every day that you give us, you have blessed us. This is truly the day that you have made and we want to uh, continue to do things to help others as we go through this day. We're thankful, Lord God, that you allowed us to come together and we're thankful, Lord God, that there are people that are fighting the good fight against poverty. We know, Lord God, that your word says that the poor will be with us always, but you have given people strength and encouragement so that they will fight against poverty, that they will help to improve people's lives, that they will cause change to happen. So, Lord, we pray and ask that you bless each person that is involved in this fight. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for this and all of your many blessings. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. If Retha Lowe would come up uh, and do the uh, welcome. Uh, Ms. Lowe is the Community Action Advisory Board Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, we as the board, advisory board for our community action would like to say welcome today and hope that uh, everyone will be able to enjoy some of the, our goals and our mission of what we are all about in helping. And a lot of people don't know what the community action is. I didn't know either until I got on board and start going through some of the training program. But our mission is to remove barriers and create opportunities for low-income individuals and families that will enable them to become more self-sufficient. And we are all doing that. This is our 50th year of bringing people out of poverty and putting them on their feet so they can be self-sufficient. And we welcome all of you today for comment, and we hope that you'll be able to get something out of our seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Aretha. Um, uh, we will now have James Green to come up, and he is uh, actually the Community Action Program Director, and he will do opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm so glad to have you guys here to join us uh, in looking at uh, poverty here in Palm Beach County. But before we begin, I uh, just want to give you a very quick overview of where we stand with the war on poverty nationwide. On January the 8th, 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared unconditional war on poverty in America. During his historic speech, President Johnson stated that this fight would not be short and easy, that no single weapon would suffice, and we must not rest until the war is done. Eight months later, he signed into law the Economic Opportunity Act, which introduced initiatives designed to improve education, 
health, skills, jobs, and access to economic resources of those struggling to make ends meet. Now, this legislation, which led to the creation of the community action programs, Head Start, Medicare, Medicaid, nutrition assistance, and other programs, have helped lift millions of people out of poverty. According to the most recent progress report conducted by the Council of Economic Advisors, and we've made these links available for you here tonight, poverty has declined by more than one-third since 1967. The percent of poverty, a population in poverty, when measured to include tax credit and other benefits have declined from 25.8% in 1967 to 16.0% in 2012. Now, decades of research has taught us that many of these programs have been a landmark success. The long-term effects of Head Start and other quality preschool programs include higher education attainment, employment and earnings, and lower rates of teen pregnancy and crime as beneficiary children become teenagers and young adults. Increased access to SNAP for children has been found to lead to better health and greater economic self-sufficiency in adulthood. Increased family income uh, in childhood from the Earned Income Tax Credit and CTC leads to higher student achievement, which complements our federal financial aid investments. These programs are costly, but many of them pay more than pay for themselves over time. Another victory is the war on poverty's battle against racial discrimination. Johnson not only cleared passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but his administration leveraged the power of the federal purse to enforce it. President Johnson threatened to withhold funding, like Medicare and public food funding, from organizations across the country if they did not comply. And this effectively made civil rights a pocketbook issue for organizations and people around the country, and it encouraged rapid desegregation. Research from around the country documents the results. When poor children began to receive help, with the education test scores continued to improve well into the 80s. Anti-discrimination policies increased diversity within the workforce and in colleges and universities across the country. And combined with other policies, we have had the black-white poverty gap between the early 1960s and today. Now tonight, we will hear what our leaders in Tallahassee are doing to address poverty within the state of Florida. The Florida Association of Community Action, which is comprised of nearly 50 anti-poverty programs all across the state, is seeking support from our current legislature to form a poverty commission and join the ranks of other states like Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, and several others. And our local community service block grant funds are increasingly oriented around encouraging work and are an important source of opportunity for low-income families. Our employment skills training, job placement, and bundled services approach has, has helped hundreds of Palm Beach residents get back on their feet after economic misfortune. Our local program has partnered with entities like Palm Beach State College, Circles of Palm Beach County, Bridges and Pathways to Prosperity to host six poverty simulations with dozens of community-based organizations and countless community re leaders represented over the past 18 months. And these simulations have helped dispel some of the myths and stereotypes about people who are living in poverty while increasing sensi uh, institutional sensitivity amongst our service providers and community leaders. We now believe that with the strength of our current leadership and Mayor Taylor and the readiness of our strategic partners who are here with us tonight, that Palm Beach County is ready to lead the state in developing innovative poverty reduction strategies while increasing opportunity and prosperity to our residents. As we look to recognize a general in this war on poverty, former Commissioner Maude Fort Lee, we hope to really begin this local fight by having a meaningful dialogue around our local issues and to lay the foundation and framework for moving forward. So tonight, without further ado, I'd like to play this short video for you tonight. And following the video, our moderator, Priscilla Taylor, our Mayor Priscilla Taylor, uh, who really needs no introduction, We'll say a few words and introduce our panelists and begin our discussion.
Well, I think we can thank President Roosevelt and President Lyndon Bain Johnson for the things that they did to make things better for those who are the less fortunate. Uh, and I know that back in the 1960s, uh, when Lyndon Bain Johnson came up with his initiative, and then they said in 1970, things were the best that they have been. But then you look now, the 80s, and things have gone backwards. So whether we uh, know that why it happened, I don't know. I know a lot of people try to define poverty. But I think now is the time to talk about eliminating it. I think we all know what it is. We know why it happens. But now is the time to talk about eliminating poverty. When the, the statistics that uh, James Green gave was very good for Palm Beach County. But I don't think we can look at the statistics in Palm Beach County and not look at what they are in the United States, period. The financial and economic crisis that erupted in 2008 caused a dramatic increase of hunger and poverty, not just in Palm Beach County, but because we know that the numbers are pretty good here, but across the United States on a hold. In 2012, there were 46.5 million people in poverty, and this is up from the 37.3 million in 2007. The number of poor people is near the largest number in the 52 years for which poverty statistics have been published. The 2012 poverty rate for Hispanics was 25.6%, for blacks, 27.2%, for Asians, 11.7%, and for non-Hispanic whites, 9.7%. 20.4 million Americans live in extreme poverty. For the richest country in the world, we have those type numbers. And for years, as I said, we tried to understand poverty. Uh, but at this point, uh, I think we defined it. We've 
studied it, uh, and it is now time to really eliminate it. We have made strides here in Palm Beach County, but that does not mean that there are not other things that we can do to eradicate and to eliminate poverty. Tonight, I, I do hope that this discussion will lead us to ideas which can, in fact, make a step, a bold step or a giant leap to eliminate poverty. We do have an esteemed and a knowledgeable panel, and I know that they will have the, the answers for us when we leave here tonight. So I will call them up, uh, and after they are seated, I will give you a brief introduction uh, bio for each. If Mark Pafford is here, if he can come on up, and your name is on your seat. Uh, Perry Borman, Tana Eberly, Diana Stanley, Dr. Deborah Robinson, and Dr. Mark Harvey, I think, is already there. Okay. Now, our first one that I will introduce is uh, Mark Pafford. Mark Pafford was actually born in Dade County, Florida. He graduated from North Miami Senior High School in 1984 and went on to earn his Associate of Arts degree at Miami Dade Community College and in 1986, his Bachelor of Public Administration degree at Florida International University in 1988. Um, Mark serves as a member of the Democratic Caucus leadership. Uh, he was actually Deputy Minority Whip uh, since in 2009, and he has served as leader of the Democratic Caucus. And during his second term, he helped organize, well, we won't go into that one. Uh, Mark is known as a staunch advocate and fighter for working families, the middle class, and vulnerable Floridians. Thank you for participating, Mark. Uh, our second is Perry Borman. And Perry is the founding executive director of the Palm Beach County Food Bank, which began in January 2012. He previously served as the regional managing director for the Florida Department of Children and Families Southeast Region. In addition to his work in the area of child welfare, hunger, and food insecurity, Perry was the executive director for the Coalition to Salute American Heroes. Uh, Perry earned an MBA from the University of Michigan and a BA in Rhetoric and Communication Studies from the University of Virginia. He and his family live in Delray Beach. And I hope I said that right. Is it Rhetoric? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and Tana, Eberly, everybody knows Tana, but we'll do a brief one anyway. Uh, for more than 18 years as his chief executive officer, Tana Eberly has steered Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County through extraordinary growth and change. The council, a special taxing district created by Palm Beach County voters in 1986, and I know you're hearing a lot about it because it's going to be on the ballot this year, provides leadership, funding, services, and research on behalf of the county's children so they grow up healthy, safe, and strong. Uh, prior to joining the council, Ms. Everly worked in the child welfare system of Texas and Virginia. Ms. Eberly received a Bachelor's of Science degree from Southwest Texas State University and a Master's degree in Human Resource from the George Washington University. Thank you for coming out. And that brings me now to Diana Stanley. Uh, Diana Stanley was raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Casanova, Novia, uh, New York. She currently resides in Riviera Beach. She graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a bachelor's degree in journalism. Diana Stanley's organization, The Lord's Place, has been dedicated to breaking the cycle of homelessness for more than 30 years through community engagement, supportive housing, job training, and employment services, reentry services, and job creation. Uh, and that brings me to Dr. Deborah Robinson. Uh, Dr. Robinson was raised in Flint, Michigan, home of the community school concept. She graduated from Flint Central High School in 1974 
and Michigan State University in 1977 with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. And additionally, she is a proud graduate of Howard University College of Medicine in the class of 1981. They have the years down. I didn't just put them. Right. <laughs> Her advocacy has included service on various parent teacher associations and school advisory committees, councils for two decades. As a school board member, Dr. Robinson has led the charge for a focus on reading instruction, a new high school at Riviera Beach, fairness in the application of disciplinary rules, algebra instruction for all eighth graders, student-oriented training for teachers, and the use of data to drive district decisions. Dr. Robinson believes that respect for the community is necessary in order to assist the community. And that brings us to our last panelist, who is Dr. Mark Harvey. Dr. Harvey earned his PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin in 2005. His research interests are in the areas of political, econ econo economy, social policy, race, class, and gender, migrant labor, family, rural sociology, and community development. Before joining the faculty at FAU, Dr. Harvey spent two years at the Southern Rural Development Center at Mississippi State University. Dr. Harvey is currently in the process of developing a grant proposal to fund research on immigration, uh, immigrant incorporation and welfare in South Florida. I thank all of the panelists for participating tonight and I will start with questions, questions and after the questions then we will open it up for Q&A from the audience. The first question is from Mark Pafford, Representative Pafford. The U.S. government is already working to address income inequality and poverty. Some people believe that the government should be doing more. Some believe it should be doing less. And some feel that the current role is about right. From your perspective, what role should the state of Florida play in addressing issues related to poverty? And what strategies are currently being implemented or introduced within our legislature? So, uh, wow, these are great microphones. Far better than what we have in Tallahassee, but I think there's probably some th conspiracy behind that. That way you don't hear what we say. Um, pretty, is there a time on this? A couple minutes? Seven. Seven? That's a lot of time. That okay, is a lot of I'm going to keep it shorter than that. So, you have a legislature that in large part is geared to people with a lot of money. Um, and I'll just be blunt. Uh, those in the state that have cash uh, to spend on campaigns and electing people that they want that will further their uh, objectives and goals. Um, in, in many, many cases, uh, extreme profit at the expense of either the people that they work for or perhaps the people that they drive by in the middle of the street uh, looking for some assistance. That's the, the form of government that you have. Um, you don't find a lot of people, perhaps, who are currently elected saying that, but that's the truth. And I think everybody here knows it. And if you don't, shame on you. Um, we have a system of government that, as an example in terms of poverty, um, would not expand Medicaid to provide health care to people in poverty. Uh, they consciously allow, you notice I didn't say the word we, uh, six people a day to die in Florida because they can't have access to breast exams, um, pap smears, uh, the types of medical assistance that you might desire if you want to live a healthy life. Um, but it goes beyond that. Uh, we have a, a system that allows people in poverty to visit hospitals as primary care. Um, that said, you have a system in Florida that caters to the very wealthy corporations. Um, and and often I, I provide an example. If you're working full time and you don't have benefits, no matter what they are, let alone a retirement, uh, and you can't afford a vehicle, let alone the insurance or the fuel, um, these are all the type of things in Florida that allow Floridians, um, and last year I know we had one of the highest rates in the nation, uh, to live in poverty. And I think 
Uh, it was Abraham Lincoln of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, the people somehow have been left out of Florida's system. I think to the counties, um, uh, positive uh, work that they've done in many municipalities throughout Florida, you're seeing a lot occur in local government to begin dealing with the issue of poverty. But uh, unfortunately, there's a large canyon. It's, a, it's an incredible disconnect between um, people working in this Florida, in, in, this, in Florida full time uh, and or not working for whatever reason, who are fr they're frankly left to deal with things on their own. And I think it's um, uh, a shame. I think it's sad that, that we have this system that caters to wealth, uh, but that's the system we have. And, and the only reason I decided to come again this year to be on this panel is to be blunt and to basically look at the audience and look at everybody around me and be blunt and say what needs to be said. Because if you're not active, then we'll continue to have this type of nonsense occur. If you get to the polls, and I'm not going to make this political, but polls in large part charge people like me to either say something or not, um, this is your responsibility. It's not mine. I'm already elected. I'm just being blunt. I'm not happy either. This is your responsibility. And if you're angry, which you should be, anytime you see a legislator, then you need to take that out in the polls. And since that's about four and a half, five minutes, I'll stop. What do you think about the minimum wage? Are you all working on anything? Because if individuals make more money, obviously they can purchase and take care of themselves probably a little bit better. Are you working on that this year? Yeah, there'll be an effort to do all those types of things. Um, but again, Florida's not built for working people. Florida is built for people to basically work themselves to the bone, their fingers to the bone, perhaps also to the bone, um, and not see any quality of life, not enjoy the fruits of their labor. Uh, I don't think anybody envisioned Florida, uh, the place that we all want to retire to, unless you're born here, um, to have that type of society in place. We have 20 million people all looking for the same resources, but all wanting to enjoy their families, all wanting to send a child to the school for the first time, all wanting to have some sort of safe housing. And, and we don't have that too often. Uh, so we're going to try different things in the legislature, but I can assure you uh, there will be tremendous pushback from the people that have. Thank you. And audience, we will have an opportunity to come back and ask questions after the panel is complete. Uh, and the timekeeper is Chanel Wilkins, who's behind me. If you want to come so I can see you, so I don't have to keep looking back. Uh, Dr. Harvey, uh, President Kennedy once said that the world is very different now. For man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. Do you believe that this is true? And can you describe how our social construct crime, economics, and housing issues are related to poverty. And I think they gave you a little more time, so. Do I also have seven minutes, or? Well, you had a little oh, more. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Green for inviting me to be um, part of this panel. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna learn uh, a lot more tonight than I uh, offer. Um, so uh, that is a, a very interesting, very big uh, question, which uh, you know I could I probably talk for a couple hours about. So it's it's, it's going to be tough to keep it down to ten minutes. Kind of the opposite of, of your problem. But um, the answer is uh, is maybe. It, it depends. Um, you know, President Kennedy was elected in in 1960. Um, and uh, basically, in, in this quote, he's referencing two factors. One is the development of the bomb, which can annihilate all of us. Uh, and at the same time, he's also talking about capitalism and uh, the development of a global capitalist system, which, in his view, could, uh, uh, if expanded, uh, to cover the globe. And if, if certain exclusionary barriers were brought down, uh, for example, you know, uh, 
Jim Crow in the U.S. South, that uh, capitalism could be an engine of, uh, uh, of poverty reduction, which would essentially take care of poverty itself. Um, uh, you know, an another thing I, I sort of took from this quote as I, I, I was starting to think about it is, um, is Kennedy is, is offering us a choice here by, by, by framing this uh, dichotomy. Do, are we going to pursue mutual uh, assured destruction or are we going to pursue uh, cooperative uh, activities for, for mutual gain? Um, now, Kennedy uh, uh, was, of course, a master of rhetoric. Um, and, you know, we still look back at that 1960 inauguration speech about uh, the time has come for a new generation, a new era, and, and we, we still get chills when we hear that speech because it, uh, it, it was not only um, uh, beautiful rhetoric but, rhetoric, but it was also prophetic, particularly in, in terms of the, uh, the civil rights issue. Um, but in, in, in framing that question, you know, Kennedy is also, um, you know, throwing down the moral gauntlet to our great um, antagonist during that time, the Soviet Union. And again, this, this quote, of, this, this is about sort of the, the competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And, 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 and which, which model of, of social organization, communism versus democratic capitalism, is going to win out? It's going to win the hearts and minds of uh, populations. So um, uh, I, I decided to, to, to talk about this uh, in terms of um, looking at both of these statements. Do we have the capacity to abolish all human life? Uh, as an empirical reality, yes, of course we do, right? And we've only gotten better at it over the last 50 years. Bigger bombs, so-called smarter bombs, et cetera. And we've spent scores of trillions of, national, of dollars of our national resources in doing so. So that's an empirical fact. Um, but um, there's also a, uh, a term that we, you know, we use in social science, which is discourse. And, and what, the, what the term discourse indicates is that basically facts don't speak for themselves. Facts are uh, always interpreted by some sort of broader story. And the story of, of mutually self-assured destruction, um, you know, was the discourse of the Cold War. Um, you know, as long as they had, you know, rel the rel relatively the same capacity as we did to blow each other up, we wouldn't do it. Um, we're now in a new, in, in terms of destruction, we're, we're now in a new era of war. And I don't want to talk too much about war, but we have the war on terror now, right? And we, ha and we have terms like surgical strikes, which are used, again, to sort of uh, legitimate the use of weaponry, right? We're, we're the good guys. We don't want to hurt anybody but the bad guys so we can construct a surgical strike. Um, my point in, in, in bringing that up is that similarly, there's a reality to poverty. There's a structure to poverty. Like it's po poverty is a fundamental, um, you could say essential aspect of, a, of our economic system. Without going into too much detail, I'll just leave that there for now. Um, now, uh, the question then is how, as a society, how do we live with poverty? How do we justify the existence of poverty? And um, at the time of Kennedy, um, the US was at the apex of its, of its wealth as a nation. I mean, we're, we're wealthier today, but we're not exactly happier. Um, the wealth isn't as distributed as, as evenly as it was back then. So Kennedy's rhetoric about poverty was that the cause of poverty was exclusion. The poor people were the victims of an exclusionary system. And you, you combat poverty by bringing down those barriers through such things as the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, um, the Economic Opportunity Act, which was carried forth by Johnson, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as uh, I think um, Mr. Green noted, from 1959 to 1973, that era of great society, federal government interaction, federally funded programs, the overall U.S. poverty rate dropped by half, from 22 percent to 11 percent. Now, since 1973, 
we haven't made much progress at all. We've, sta we've stayed around 13, 12, 13 percent, jumped up to 15 percent as a, as a result of the recession, and we're down, back down to 15 percent today. So what happened? And the bottom line, I would argue, is economic restructuring, the transformation of the U.S. economy from a manufacturing base with uh, strong unions and a Democratic Party that was invested uh, in representing those unions to a, a service-oriented economy um, that is essentially bifurcated into two tiers. You've got your top well-paying uh, jobs that everybody wants, but, re that, but which require a very high degree of education. Then you've got your bottom tier, which are basically jobs that are intended to serve the people with the good jobs. So your v various ser service workers of, of many kinds. Um, those middle-level, blue-collar manufacturing jobs that offered people a, a quality, um, a high quality of life and a uh, 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 secure income are greatly, di greatly diminished, right? They're not completely gone, but uh, the middle has essentially shrunk. So um, economic restructuring, um, what some people would call a, a war on unions, um, has essentially contributed to the sort of income inequality that, uh, that Mr. Pafford referenced in, in his comments. Um, in, in 1979, the top 1% uh, received about 9% um, uh, of the total national income. Today, that figure is over 20%. Um, so the, obviously, the more, the, the bigger the slice of the pie that the 1% gets, the, left, the, the less that is left for those in the, in the middle and below. Um, now, importantly, as the, as the structure of the economy has changed, the discourse about poverty also changed. And the discourse went from, being, from, from uh, poor folks being, uh, being marginalized by the system, excluded by the system, to, for, to poor folks being irresponsible, to not having um, high enough intelligence to succeed in the workplace to not having uh, good morals, making bad decisions, to, um, to these personal, individual level uh, uh, factors. And, and what that represented was a, a shift in our understanding from poverty as, as, as an aspect of society that can be changed to a view of poverty as something that is inherent in an individual and that can't be stamped out. Or that, or that if, if it can be changed, it can only come from the individual themselves. Uh, government policies aren't going to do anything to change that. And along with that, that new view of poverty, which you've all, you know, you've all heard this term, the culture of poverty and the underclass, came a, a, a new negative view of the federal welfare state. And this idea that the federal welfare state can't do anything right when it comes to uh, poverty, so they should sort of step out of it. And so as a result of that view, we've seen over the last 30 years sort of just that, the federal government stepping back, devolving authority uh, for, say, welfare programs to states and localities, and, um, and as, again, Mr. Pafford referenced, uh, a state like Florida doesn't really have the uh, capacity or uh, interest, unfortunately, at, at the moment to, um, to, to address the issue. So. Um, in conclusion, what I tried to do, what I wanted to get, do is give you a little bit of a historical, structural kind of uh, perspective on poverty. That's how we social scientists look at it, and we can flesh that out more with some um, questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Borman, a food insecure household sometimes doesn't have the financial resources to provide food for all of its members. It is a more common problem than most of us think. In 2010, nearly 50 million American households were listed as food insecure. And as you can imagine, when you are worried about having enough money to buy food for your family, whether or not the food you do manage to buy is making you fat is probably not a top concern. Bad food is better than no food. From a local perspective, give us an idea on how prevalent this issue, prevalent is this issue, and, and describe how food insecurity relates to poverty. poverty. Also, tell us what resources you feel are needed to help address this issue. 
Well, thanks, uh, Mayor Taylor. I also, wants to also want to thank Mr. Uh, Green and the county for um, hosting this important conversation and the opportunity to participate in it. One of the first things I want to do is actually define what food insecurity means, because uh, it's a term that's bandied about, and um, a lot of times people don't define it appropriately. Food insecurity is the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. This is a lot more complicated than talking about hunger. Let me just kind of cover that again. Reliable access, sufficient quantity, affordable, nutritious food. So when I talk about it, it's really kind of the three A's, availability, accessibility, and affordability. And to the question of um, how prevalent this issue is in Palm Beach County, um, here are some facts. You know, whether it's uh, some of the data that we have, um, both from the county, but also from organizations like Feeding America. Uh, Feeding America estimates that a little over 15% of all of Palm Beach County residents are food insecure. That's a little over 200,000 people. That includes about 23% of all of our children. About 63,000 kids are food insecure. We also know from the school system that more than 59% of all of the kids in the public school system uh, are qualify for free or reduced price lunch. And you probably already know that Palm Beach County is the 13th or 14th largest school system in the United States. And uh, uh, Mr. Green earlier was talking about food stamps or SNAP. Uh, latest data from my friends uh, at DCF is approximately 184,000 residents uh, are receiving SNAP here in Palm Beach County. Um, I tend to presume that there's a direct link between food insecurity and poverty, uh, as in the individuals who need to rely on food pantries and soup kitchens or other emergency food assistance programs um, do so because they can't afford to put food on their table. So to me, there's sort of this automatic link. Um, I don't think you're in poverty because you're food insecure, but you're more likely to be food insecure because you're in poverty. Um, to the second question um, related to, uh, or the second part of that question, the comment about you know bad food is better than no food. I'm not sure who said that. But um, you know, the reality is that food that is, I'm not a nutritionist, um, and I don't work for the health department, so there's a lot smarter people here um, who are uh, physicians, et cetera. Um, the reality is that food that is high in salt and saturated fat is more affordable, is more accessible, and is more available uh, for, for anyone, uh, but certainly for individuals in poverty, than is healthier food. Uh, the irony of this topic to me is that we live in the richest agricultural community east of the Mississippi. The state of Florida leads, uh, excuse me, Palm Beach County leads the state of Florida in the growth and the production of at least six vegetables and leads the United States in the growth and the production of sweet corn. So I often wonder in the work that we do is how is it uh, that we can have this issue here given where we live? Um, it's a real disconnect for me in terms of doing more to connect our local agricultural community, which, by the way, is incredibly generous uh, in this fight against hunger. And, and I would argue in this community, the agricultural community is more generous and involved than any other industry. But how do we connect these two things um, together? Um, I don't think um, people are dying of starvation in Palm Beach County. Um, uh, I may be incorrect on that, but I, that's not something you read about in the newspaper. Uh, and when you don't have money to buy food, um, you are focused on eating, uh, plain and simple. You may not be focused on eating healthy food. But personally, I don't think it's a black or white issue. I think we need to help organizations and people who, who live on an extremely limited income figure out how to eat healthier. Because again, the definition of food insecurity has this word nutrition uh, in it. Um, and, and the other data that we have from the health department, uh, that's, that's a significant cost, to not only to our community, but in other communities around the United States, is the cost of obesity and diabetes. I mean, in Palm Beach County, 
uh, at least 30%, probably more, of all first through fifth graders are overweight or obese uh, based on body mass index. Um, so uh, the second question about what resources uh, are needed to address this issue, uh, this is a um, like the earlier comment, I think we need a couple more hours uh, to answer that. Uh, and it's also difficult to answer uh, because I think we first need to define uh, what problem or problems we're trying to solve. Uh, for example, the solutions, I think, to manage the problem are difficult than the solutions to prevent it. Um, a couple of funders uh, I know in our county are in the beginning stages of planning a process that will focus on strategically looking at food insecurity in Palm Beach County, uh, and that's an important first step. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Robinson, one of the biggest reasons why America's economic malaise may last for decades is because high school dropouts among the nation's long-term unemployed are essentially shut out of the jobs market. 15% of American high school dropouts aged 25 and older were unemployed on a seasonally adjusted basis, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's nearly double the rate for high school graduates with some amount of college education and three times higher than that of collegians with bachelor's degrees. The problem is even worse with the new generation of dropouts who have fewer pros prospects for employment Nearly a third of dropouts aged 16 to 24 are out of work on a not seasonally adjusted basis. These young men and women can't get into high paying white collar jobs or even get into apprenticeships for blue collar jobs such as welding, which can provide them with, with middle class incomes. From a local perspective, can you describe how we are performing locally and how education, or the like thereof relates to poverty. Also, in your opinion, what might be the best approach for addressing this issue? Thank you. Um, I also want to thank um, Mr. Green and, and the mayor for hosting this seminar. And there's some good questions. Um, I look forward to the Q&A afterwards. But um, as stated, failure to achieve a high quality education dramatically increases the chances of unemployment and poverty. Furthermore, living in poverty is a predictor of academic underachievement. These two evils perpetuate each other generation after generation. Now, Palm Beach County School District has made a significant positive impact on breaking this cycle, but we have not broken the cycle. Let me just tell you a few of um, the things that we're trying to do. First, the number one area of underperformance is reading, specifically reading comprehension. We just adopted a new reading curriculum last year, which has strategies to push reading comprehension to higher levels. As with any significant change, there have been hurdles, and we had to revamp our focus into staff development to ensure that our staff is prepared and comfortable with these higher level expectations. One area that I must continue to press for, scream for, is the explicit instruction in vocabulary. Limited vocabulary limits comprehension and limits co opportunities. In one of my reading roundtables, a reading expert proclaimed, vocabulary is the hidden weapon of the middle class. So we must work on uh, explicit instruction in vocabulary. And that's actually something that we should do inside and outside of the school system. Secondly, we continue to work on school climate and culture that embraces all adults and children for the gifts that they bring and work to improve the areas of their weakness. Thirdly, the most important person on the school campus is, in fact, the principal. The principal sets the culture and expectation. The principal should observe, support, and strengthen the teacher, who in turn would then observe, support, and strengthen the student. We recognize the importance of the principalship, and we must work to um, develop their greatness, those that are already in the role, and future principals as well. Uh, fourthly, we've had great success in increasing uh, graduation rates at some of our struggling high schools by providing grant supported at graduation coaches. These coaches worked with students, sometimes almost hand holding, to guide them past the obstacles to graduation. Um, these coaches, as mentioned, are grant funded, and so we must find a way to continue 
um, that support after the grant expires next year. Now, I am personally struggling with how to address the issues in schools of concentrated poverty. Um, as mentioned, it's the statistic that I was given is 57.59% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. So we have some schools that are in the high 90th percentile of students on free and reduced lunch. Um, children that live in poverty generally have more obstacles to success than middle class children. St statistically, societal, community, and home problems are more likely to cause distractions for these students. They tend to be more distracted and more needy. Does it mean that they have to be? But statistically, that's the case. When schools have large percentages of distracted and or needy students, the caring adults tend to get overwhelmed and burned out. So time and time again, we see well-trained teachers abandon high poverty schools as soon as they can. So my struggle um, as a policymaker is whether or not we need to actively uh, minimize schools that have concentrated poverty, essentially to whether or not we need to um, what is the word I'm looking for? Desegregate, if you will, based on socioeconomic status. That, of course, would cause a lot of conversation. But um, sixth, uh, we have specialized coaches in some of our schools. You could think of them as pseudo social workers. And they were placed in high need schools, initially um, funded by a grant written by the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. These people work to assure that restorative justice practices are available for students, to assure that positive behavior intervention supports are in place, and that we stop the gotcha practices that have all too often gotten children um, on that pathway out of school. Seventh, we have parent academies. Um, coming and Office of Family Affairs and Community Engagement to inform and strengthen parents in their role, which I must um, testify to is the most difficult role in the world. Eight, we're expanding our early childhood programs. Nine, we must continue to expand vocational programs in the alternative ed schools, because we, ha we have got to make sure that children who have gotten off of the right path, so to speak, are not denied opportunities um, to uh, good paying jobs. Um, tenth, we are in the process of completing our disparity study that will support our MWBE or Minority Women Business Enterprise Program because it is clear that um, companies owned by people of color are more likely to hire people of color and take a chance on non-traditional potential employees. Eleventh, I will continue to fight to have our undoing racism trainings so that we better understand the systemic and systematic nature of oppression based on race. This is important to combat poverty because in this country, we continue to play out the cognitive dissonance that was required for good people to enslave other humans for financial benefit. This is why we continue to see this correlation between race and income. So understanding the structure of oppression based on race and working together to eliminate it will help not only to decrease poverty, but will also help to decrease other forms of oppression. But my real question is, in this country, do we really want to eliminate poverty? Because I have to just say, I quote my oldest son, who said when he was earning his MBA repeatedly, mom, you're beating your head against a brick wall. This is a capitalist country, and capitalism requires an underclass. So I think that we need to be clearly aware as we, we have these goals, that we're, we're fighting something much bigger than ourselves. Um, and do we really want, we, whoever we are, do we really want to end poverty? Thank you. I think, you know, based upon what you said, but there's a lot of things that you said that I, and I don't know if you have time to address it tonight during the Q&A or whatever, but um, the boredom maybe of the students and maybe we need to restructure, you know, with the schools that some kids, you know, uh, need to learn differently. Mm -hmm. And we used to have the, the um, where they learn a trade or something like that. And I know that Bill Gates Foundation started a entrepreneurship high school where there's actually no dropouts of that case. And they, um, what, if only a minute. 
Only a minute. If you can't do it in a minute, we'll come back to you. Okay. So. Do it in a minute. Okay. So part of what you're talking about is is <laughs> is restructuring the program, and so I mentioned the vocational programs. But let's go back to this. I just just think about this question of what we really want to do because we have a lot of career programs in the Palm Beach County School District. They were they were outlined by groups of business people who talked about what was needed here. But I'm trying to understand why am I fought every day when I'm trying to reinstitute cosmetology? Who's okay? fighting you? Well, I'm not going to name the name right now, but just think <laughs> about it. Okay? No, but think no, but listen to me because cosmetology creates an entrepreneur. It That's doesn't put money in the pocket of certain organizations here. Well, I mean, I'm know. just saying we part of part of this system is designed to create employees or who are ready to do a good job for other people. So we talked about the service industry, but it also could be higher tech service as well. But there's a pushback on entrepreneurship here. Well, actually, and I this book that I purchased years ago. Um, uh, talked about poverty and what's it Ruby what what's the name on that thing oh, Ruby Payne and um, well Ruby Payne was no but then there was someone who countered yeah. what Ruby Payne was saying but it talked more or less about entrepreneurship even making it be mandatory for a student to graduate from high school to have uh, entrepreneurship class and do a business plan uh, and if these things are shown to work in places to me that is something that we should look at now you mentioned some things and, and Mark mentioned about voting and so what I'm going to do is take one minute and ask all people who are elected or want to be elected to stand. Oh, we have quite a few people who want to be elected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, that brings us, what's our time like? We're okay? Okay. Ms. Stanley. According to Caledon Institute of Social Policy, the philosophy that underlies community-based approaches to poverty reduction views poverty alleviation as more than an end itself. Poverty alleviation is a subset of broader economic development. Community approaches to poverty reduction are not service-based interventions that regard individuals as clients who need assistance. Instead, these approaches have a direct or ultimate economic purpose. They focus upon the active pursuit of market-based strategies, often geographic and sector-specific, that exploit market niches for beneficiaries. You are representing the nonprofit chambers, which includes over 50 nonprofits throughout Palm Beach County. You are also president and CEO of a nonprofit. From your perspective, what collective innovative strategies or opportunities currently exist that would be most effective in addressing issues related to poverty in Palm Beach County? Thank you. And let me thank Mayor Taylor and James Green and the county for once again having this important conversation. You know, the definition of poverty, according to Webster, is the state or condition of having little or no money or means of support. It is a condition of being poor. So when we talk about this Caledine Institute, which by the way comes out of Canada, it reflects the prevailing sentiment that if government provides funding for programs designed to improve the overall economic well-being, they will have a direct and immediate impact on reducing poverty. And I completely agree with that conclusion. However, I do not agree with the notion that in order to have and to eradicate poverty, you must not look at the client. And that is what this study is saying. It is important to note that any a nonprofit that serves a client does play a critical role in the eradication of poverty. There are micro or government solutions that have demonstrated their effectiveness in working to end poverty from a micro level, we must never forget the immediate needs of the person, which is where the nonprofits help to eradicate poverty one person at a time. John F. Kennedy is generally given credit with the saying, a rising tide floats all boats. And in the case of poverty, the Calendine Institute would agree that the government steers the boat. But make no mistake, it is the nonprofits who row the boat. 
although poverty is being deemed more than the clients in this question, we would be remiss not to understand the intersection of poverty and the work of nonprofits. Poverty is a state or a condition, while human needs are immediate. Poverty can be seen through the lenses of economic and market value. However, none of this will occur if we do not meet the basic needs of the individual. As we talk about eradicating poverty in a community, we must remember that Maslow theory clearly states that we must meet human needs before we even think about eradicating or bringing economy to the, to the scale. Services provided by our incredibly rich community here includes mental health services, creation of supportive and affordable housing, substance abuse treatment, access to health care, services for the disabled and the elderly, literacy programs and feeding programs are all the cornerstones to get people prepared to help end poverty. Each are geared to meet the immediate needs of the individual, and many of those that we serve, especially at the Lord's Place, have come out of poverty. We understand that in order to break this cycle, we must first look at the individual. So it must go hand in hand. If we are going to look at poverty as a way of economic development, which is how it should end and we need more jobs, we must always keep in mind and keep in sync the need for the human person to be cared for and to be loved for. People in poverty don't have the same money that we do, they oftentimes cannot purchase the services of mental health or the services of health care. So the human services and the nonprofits must come in and must be able to provide those resources for them. And poverty oftentimes can be looked at like a straitjacket, right? They, they can't seem to get out of it. And so as we come in as non-for-profits with human health and human service agencies, our job is to come to them and to provide accessibility to them so that we can end, we can end poverty. We are to deal with each person as an individual and address their human needs as the role of the nonprofit in addressing poverty. And all of this can be accomplished. We must never lose sight of the individual in the world of poverty, each with their own struggles and each with their own challenges. Government has a very important role by standing, by stimulating the economy and by encouraging us to look at poverty in a different way. But there are people who will still fall through the cracks of services when they aren't available. So how do we nonprofits collectively and innovatively start, start eradicating poverty in our beautiful community? There are four ways. Number one is we advocate. We advocate, we advocate, we advocate. We go up to see Mark Pafford, and we go up to Tallahassee, and we go to the government, and we continue to advocate for change. We advocate for a strong living wage. We advocate for policies that will allow to continue to provide the resources we need to serve those in poverty. We can be their voices of those struggling with poverty, their advocates, and we can tell their stories. We must fight for the living wage, and we must fight for change. Number two, we need to create, and we need to partner in affordable housing. At the end of the day, when poverty is, we look at communities that are stricken with poverty, many of them are stricken because they don't have housing that any of us would live in. We need to come together and create affordable housing for our folks. We need to train, we need to educate, we need to employ, and we need to create jobs. Because at the end of the day, the only way to empower, to break the cycle, especially in the world of poverty, is to give people work. We all know that self-esteem is the first step of getting out of poverty. Then we need to think about social enterprises. Social enterprises are an, an innovative way to bring work to communities and to also establish when a community is being re redeveloped to be able to bring businesses to them. We need to be able to look at businesses in ways that are both traditional and non-traditional. And mostly the nonprofits, we need to reaffirm our commitment to win the war on poverty. Understand that poverty is an invisible thread which runs through all of our health and human service agencies. The synergy of nonprofits working together, we should not be the afterthought. Rather, nonprofits are the beginning, the middle, and the end as communities are preparing for economic development and poverty. The nonprofits will be the boots on the ground and work in tandem with government, businesses, and communities so that we can end poverty one person at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tana, Evely, um, studies that have followed children from birth through adulthood to find a strong relationship between an early childhood in poverty and an increased risk of problems later in life. How can we explain the relationship between the risk factors associated with poverty and a child's developing social and emotional competencies? And from your perspective, 
What innovative strategies have you implemented within Palm Beach County to address these issues? Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mayor, for hosting and Mr. Green for uh, creating and being the wind behind this uh, event along with your staff. I think that um, one of the things that is probably seldom understood and looked at is where is the genesis? Where is the research showing us that the starting point is for the future, for the life trajectory of a, a child? And what is becoming empir empirically clear is the relationship between the social determinants of health, both physical and social emotional, embedded in early childhood. Um, and these aren't just casual social determinants, they are clear, measurable social determinants between early childhood and future life course. So what does this mean? What this means is what Mark Pafford has talked about, Dr. Robinson, uh, Ms. Stanley, Dr. Harvey, and that is that this country has failed to invest in what it takes to support the healthy development of our children and particularly the healthy development of our young children. We know and we can say, well, this country is not like other countries that have chosen to do this. But those other countries' outcomes for their children are phenomenally different than the outcomes that this country has for our children. And that is the difference between facing what we need to do and not accepting what we need to do. And what do I mean by this? There are countries that are looking at how they are actually developing effective beginning from the point of preventing teen births and having a totally different conversation about adolescent sexuality and health. Now, I know we're not supposed to talk about that, but that's a fact, and there is a direct, direct correlation between poverty and the, the age of the, the child, the age of the mother when that child is born, and the future trajectory of that child's life. In fact, that's the number one predictor of child outcomes. Second, those countries are willing to invest in maternal child health to ensure that all women and all families have access to good quality health care prenatally. Third, at birth, they're willing to invest and understand the importance of supporting new families. What I mean by new families is families with new babies, whether this is their first baby or third baby because we know what happens relative to the relationship of that parent with that child. The connectivity and the nurturing and the support between that infant and parent are absolutely critical. And if we have 33% or more of our mothers being depressed, either clinically or non-clinically, and not being able to interact with that baby, we already have a problem. Dr. Robinson mentioned words and vocabulary as being the keys to the future. That development of those words and vocabulary start with the newborn through infancy, through young childhood. You watch, you see how parents coo or talk or interact with those babies. And you see when they don't what happens. Next, those countries are investing in quality early care and education from infancy through school entry. They're not investing in daycare, and they're not investing in child care. They are investing in quality caring for infants because parents are working, and for three, toddlers and three and four-year-olds. This is not saying we'll accept minimal quality, that we will accept the turnover in those childcare environments of staff that are turning over faster than the kids are. 
so kids are not developing and connecting. Are we willing to pay for that in this country? No. Are we willing to pay for that in this state? No. We are not. It has to change. And finally, when we talk about our young children, we know that third grade is a critical point. We also know that we have significant summer learning loss. What are we doing about it? How are we proactively investing in quality summer programs that support the maintaining, in fact, advancing of what children have left school and then go back to school with? All of those, that, everything I've talked about is really talking about how are we creating an infrastructure that supports families with young children. Unlike K through 12, which by, by the way, CSC by statute cannot fund or support. Unlike K through 12, there is no connectivity in early childhood. There's no system. There's no relationship between any of those things to be tied together. But that's what this county is investing in through the CSC. We are talking about how are we creating high quality maternal child health programs, evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention programs, working from the universal to the deep end, bringing programs to this community that work, working in neighborhoods and not just with programs. How are we doing creating and supporting parent quality parenting education and bringing this together as a whole in this community? And so that's the work that we're involved in. What this means, bottom line, is not only do we have to create a whole infrastructure in a community and in this country for our young children, but we have to bring it to scale. And we don't do that. Those other countries have the infrastructure and they have the scale. And what I mean by scale is everybody has access, not just a few to what is needed. Thank you. At this time, we're going to go, if there are any questions, if anyone, we have cards. Um. We have a letter. Uh, Diana, OK, Tana or Diana. There is a number of uh, uh, research that supports the fact that collective impact strategies are much more effective than agencies working within their own silos. In your opinion, what is needed for nonprofits to begin to utilize this strategy in Palm Beach County? So, Diane. Yeah, um, collective impact is going to be the, the, new, um, um, uh, the new program that we're gonna see more and more. We see a lot of funders in our community now starting to do that. Clearly for us to um, address poverty, silos need to go down. And we talk that word silo so often. I think it's really about us reaching across the aisles, very much like what we need to do in Congress with, with our non-for-profits, and being able to come together as one, one voice and, and one group to be able to start making some collective um, changes in our community. Tana. Um, the word collective impact is right now pretty popular. Very popular, right. <clears throat> But let's talk about what it really means. What it means is that if I'm Mother Mary and I walk into a, a, health, clin a health clinic and the issues that I'm facing with myself and my child are ones that include not having medical care, not having access to child care, not having access to uh, housing, is that there is a coordinated systemic approach that Mother Mary can get across sectors, across silos, one answer, one coordinated solution that works for Mother Mary that may be different than Father John who walks in, but there is a systematic coordinated effort. That means that agencies, Funders, everybody has to be willing to work differently. And we know that it works because we're doing that for our maternal child health system across 30 separate agencies working as one. But 
it takes effort and it takes working from a data-driven system that you're looking at what's happening, what the data is telling you, where people are going, what's happening to them, and is what you're providing working or not working. Um, there's a, that's, and I agree with you, and there's also some interesting things. We have an, a funder right now in our community that's willing to do collective impact in communities. So when I think of collective impact, I'm really looking at some really interesting grassroots stuff that's starting to happen, um, where you're starting to see people in areas like Delray Beach and Riviera Beach and Boynton Beach, communities coming together saying that we have a personal responsibility to start making change within our community. And I think that's the positive part of it, with some expert around the t experts around the table, but it really is about change happening in a larger sense than ever before. So it, it, it could be a very exciting time for our community right now. And we're seeing that in our 10 communities with our bridges. Right. It's, it's phenomenal. Awesome. Right. Do you all see, though, within the nonprofits, because I know in, in business and a lot of other areas where you see everyone is so territorial, they don't want to give up anything for whatever reason. Do you see that? And I'm sure that that would be a barrier. Uh, and if so, are you working, trying to eliminate it, and how? Yeah, I can tell you from the nonprofit chamber, um, we, we, the barriers disappear when we all come together in a room, and I've got some of my colleagues here, and I mean, clearly it is about serving the clients. So as long as the um, agencies are like-minded and share the same values that clients come first, I think those barriers start to drop, and I think we're able to do more work. It is still always, always important for us to have open communication so we can get there. But I think it's changing, and I think that you're seeing much more of a collaborative approach, especially as we keep our eyes focused on the clients. Okay, thank you. I guess this would be for Dr. Robinson and Mark uh, Pafford, really. But will year-round schools solve some of our children's issues, learning curve? And Tana mentioned that, but you talk on it. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, no, actually there's, and there's a lot of information out there, and in fact, one of the things that I've been pushing for is that we use the year-round schools, and that doesn't mean that the children are in school every week. Um, there's different models. The one I'm, I like is the 45-15, so that they're in schools, like in school nine weeks and out three, um, but that will help to minimize the summer slide. Um, and then the other thing is we could use that to partner with community agencies to have um, ex not only acceleration but enrichment programs during that three weeks, um, assuming that parents are working. But so what I've been pushing in the school district is that schools take that up as a choice program. We've had conversations as a, as a board about um, year-round schools and you know, the conversation swings from one end to the other, but clearly we're not gonna wave the magic wand and go year round in all schools because that will create um, unnecessary pushback. But as a choice, for choice, as a choice program, that's the way we need to go. Well, I know in the legislature we discussed it when I was there, Mark, and I think it came back up where I don't know if there's the will to do anything about it now. So to kind of paint the picture, you had a governor three or four years ago who cut the entire line item for homelessness in the state of Florida. To, just to kind of, I mean, that's at the end of the day, the type of mindset that we have. And I'll say it again, the governor, the current governor, zeroed out the entire homeless line item in the state of Florida. So frankly, they don't give a damn. Now, may I go on? So when you talk about schools, Sure, I think it's great if you have year-round schools, but the problem always goes back to the fact that the devil's in the details. If you don't have wraparound services, if you have early learning that continues to have huge wait lists so parents can uh, get their toddlers uh, into a safe environment so they can get to work, that's an issue. If you don't have proper health care, that's an issue. If you don't have housing that allows a, a, a family or those guardians of that, that child to have a safe um, environment to study, that's an issue. Um, you know, we could go on and on and on. And, and again, this comes back to the devil in the details. And I think people really, and I'm talking to you, um, I can only tell you what I see. There's a lot of selfish people who have been elected to office who are going to guarantee their futures on paid political advertisements and mailings that make them look great. Bobby, oh, Bobby, is he here? 
No. No. Is there any elected official in here who's going to send out anything that makes them look like horrible? <laughs> of course not. And the language that they use in those mailers and the television slots, they're going to be beautiful people. We've got to learn to be smart enough to understand when people zero out entire lines like homeless. Well, we are on the school now, so if you would just, you know. The there, you know what? There's a lot of homeless you students have, in school. You, you have answered the question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think from what I can recall when I was in the legislature, where there were parents actually who were not for year-round schools, and that is why we did not go forth with it. Uh, regarding Dr. Robinson's son's comment that our system requires an underclass, to what extent do you share this view and what can be done to fix it and or improve their conditions? Dr. Robinson. I don't know if I share the view, but I wonder if it's true. Um, I think that if, if I reach the conclusion that, um, that our country requires an underclass, I would stop trying. And so I won't reach that conclusion because I want to keep trying to make things better. But um, what was the second part? And what can be done to fix it and or improve their conditions of the underclass? Well, that's what we're talking about is um, how to improve the conditions. But I think that in terms of strategy, I think that we have to find a way to get some of these people that <laughs> Representative Paff is talking about to see what's in it for them. Um, and I don't have that magic sound bite yet, you know, but, or at least as we, we um, interact with, with people who, um, who may be a little bit less resistant than some folks in Tallahassee, we, we need to get them to understand why they as individuals, as comfortable as that they might be still um, have a reason to end poverty, have a reason to help others. Dr. Harvey, would you like to? Yes, uh, thanks. Um, in terms of the, uh, this notion of the, that, that we need an underclass, I think that was the comment. Um, yeah, that you know, comes from a uh, basically, basically uh, you know, Marxist um, analysis of uh, capitalism, right, which maintains that in order to maximize profits, it's in the interest of capital to have a, what Marx called a reserve army of workers at the ready to step in uh, and work for um, uh, low wages and, and essentially undercut workers who are trying to bargain for better wages and working conditions. So insofar as, um, you know, from, the, from that perspective, uh, having an unemployed, not, not necessarily an underclass, which is a bit of a different thing, but an, a group of unemployed persons is uh, functional for a capitalist economic system. Um, now, as regards the, as the underclass is, you know, this is a, a very pernicious uh, concept. It's a very uh, derogatory way of, of talking about the poor that became popular uh, in the 1980s and um, has become, you know, along with the culture of poverty, one of the main metaphors that the general public uh, and, the, and the mass media uh, and politicians uh, have, have used to portray uh, folks who are in poverty in the, in the United States. And I think um, we could talk all night about various solutions, but insofar as I emphasized the role of discourse in my brief presentation, um, I think we need to uh, essentially uh, drop the notion of the underclass. The fact is that the vast majority of people who ever experience poverty uh, experience, experience it for a relatively short period of time before they um, move back into the labor force and, and start making money. And, but even now, nowadays, with the transformation of the labor force, working is often not enough to, to get out of poverty. So, but this notion of the underclass is that, that, that those people, again, lack morals or work ethic is, is pernicious, and it has led to very bad uh, public policy. I think this question um, is related to um, that particular question. Uh, it's, it's for the entire panel. Uh, Dr. Robinson's son, you brought your son in, but now we're going to talk about your son. <laughs> Dr. Robinson's son was right. Isn't poverty a necessary evil of, cap of capitalism? Every issue each panelist talked about can be directly tied to the need of the system to have profit provided by cheap labor. Education, uh, food, insecurity, and what I 
guess that's security. Um, politics, childhood, education, these are all interconnected via capitalism. And the question is, do you feel the answer is political so that economic restructuring can be done uh, and educating to reprogram the citizenry? So who wants to take a stab at that? Nobody? Mark, you have one minute. One minute? <laughs> Yes, it's it's political. It's it's um, it's our civic duty. Um, when you see the pendulum swing so far to the wealthy, and those that aren't on that other side are suffering, and that's what this is. That's what poverty is in a lot of cases. Then it really is a reflection upon us uh, as to whether or not we're going to assist our neighbor, as to whether or not we're going to provide the care and the love. Um, and the ability to be able to dream. And if we're purposely denying that ability, then our society has great trouble. It's political. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Doc, did you, Doc I would Harvey? just like to say, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that insofar as capitalists need to sell their stuff. Therefore, they need consumers. They need people who have enough, enough money to buy things. And that was the great insight of Henry Ford, was to pay his workers enough such that they could buy a car and his profits uh, exploded. So um, uh, it's... Uh, but, you know, the, the, the fact is that there has, um, you know, always been uh, folks, we, we've, we've relied on, on, on immigrant labor, on, share, you know, on Jim Crow labor uh, to, to essentially subsidize um, the standard of living for the rest of us. So there, it's, it's super complicated, yeah. Uh, Dr. Robinson, one minute. Yeah, the original sin of this country, right? was free labor, right? And, um, and it was also the way we became the world's like richest country. But yes, it absolutely is political. And it just seems that, and the reason I mentioned what my son said is because it bounces in my head a lot of whether or not that's true. And while I appreciate your, um, your description of how the pendulum swung there, um, the reason that I, I talk about the undoing racism training so much is because it clearly outlines that it's not the individual's fault. I mean, you know, we, all of us could do better in whatever way, but it really outlines the structure of the discrimination that in large measure causes the statistical significantly relationship between race and poverty. And I'm, you're the sociologist, I'm not, and the, but I would, I would really like to see the, the disaggregated data on who can get out of poverty because it is people of color who tend to get stuck in multi-generational poverty. So um, I, I, I'm, that statement really kind of um, tweaked my interest because what I'm fighting is the effect of multi-generational lack of access, so. That is very interesting. We have two more questions that I asked. They should be pretty brief. Mark, the question was asked, uh, what was your feelings on minimum wage? The answer was not given. I asked you about the minimum wage. You didn't say much on it, so. You wow, a politician didn't answer the question? <laughs> you have one minute to answer it. I'm, I'm all about the minimum wage because the middle class has been destroyed. How's that for an answer? Okay, we can't take any more. This is the last question is what can we do as parents, Dr. Robinson, this question was asked to you, what can we do as parents, leaders to bring to the forefront, to the front burner, cosmetology, auto repair, et cetera, that is of interest and a need universally? Just speak to it, please. I mean, speak to it. I mean, if, if you don't want to come to the board meetings, send emails to boardofficegroup at palmbeachschools.org because it, it, it gets relegated as there's Debbie again. I'm, and so I just please add your voice to mine because we, we've got to kind of shift this because those that are doing well in our system have a lot of, a lot of opportunities and those that don't, we have to, we have to create more opportunities for them so that when they get out, they can make a good living with the higher minimum wage. 
Well, they can hire somebody, and it, that's the way it used to be. And, and whoever wrote that, I would encourage you to form a group and get together and go to the school board. You can send an email, but I tell you, you get better results when you go to the board and you bring up your issue there and make it heard, because that's the only way we're going to get a difference. I think it's awful that we have schools already ready for auto repair, beauty schools, and everything, and they're not being used. What a shame. That ends it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give our panel a hand, please. Thank you all for taking the time to come tonight. Um, we're not finished. We have a little bit more to go. Um, actually, what we've heard is a lot of information for the CAC to work on. Um, you know, and the call to action, I think, is what can we do going forth? You heard some very interesting comments, and I know that they are, uh, from what I was told, that it is not, poverty is not in our plan. Um, and maybe this is something that can be brought to the board to be put in our plan. We had the five-year plan to end homelessness. Maybe there's a, something that we can put together to put in our plan to end uh, poverty. Uh, or maybe it's commingled. I don't know. But it's certainly something that we need to look at. Uh, I'm going to bring up Chanel Wilkins, who is the Community Service Department Director. And he will be followed by Michael Gogger, Chief Deputy, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, and also the Chair of the CAC. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I just want to make sure that I thank everyone for coming and talk. And actually, I'm going to steal the opportunity to talk a little bit about, I think, the seminal question which was in this room, which was, um, does capitalism demand poverty? And in many respects, I believe it does. But what is the size of that poverty? And what is the size of the middle class that becomes optimal for a great nation? And I think those are things that when we look at the data and we try and tie that back together, we'll be able to figure out a better way to move more people out of poverty and change the faces of poverty. At the Department of Community Services, we really try and address these disparities in wealth um, using a lot of the collective impact people talk about. Um, because we have all of our other divisions who work hand in hand with James and Community Action. And we want this, our department to be the focal point as you think about questions and ways and solutions to address it. Uh, planning, policy, and piloting, implementing new ideas and thoughts is where most of our divisions want to go, and we want your support in doing so. And as part of that, we have the Citizens Advisory Council, so I'll bring up Michael Garger, who looks across the human services elements and helps us, along with many citizens, to navigate these waters and to come to you with new ideas. Michael? Thanks, Jill. First, I'd like to say that uh, I, I wear two hats. Uh, one is the chairman of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, for Health and Human Services for the county. And their mission is to assist the Board of Commissioners in the assessment of need, planning, and implementation and evaluation as defined in the Health and Human Services element of the Palm Beach County Comprehensive Plan, and to create forums for citizens' participation. We have 11 committee members and six ex officio members. They're all committed to achieve this goal and mission. As the chair of the CAC, we intend to initially address the poverty issue in Palm Beach County by developing an overall goal in our key indicator report and by reviewing our current reducing poverty objective in the health and uh, human services element. Both the indicator report and the health and human services element are documents that are written to be used as a guide for Mayor Taylor and the Board of County Commissions and for community leaders when making decisions as to promote public participation in government. I plan to immediately concentrate on this task, and on September 11th, the CAC, at their regular committee meeting, will meet to discuss the general framework of this project. Everyone is welcome to attend the meeting, and we look forward to, to your participation. Uh, for, if you'd like further information about the CAC, our mission, or the indicator report, you can access the web links on the handout or contact David Rafatis. David's back here at 355-4705. And then quickly, as a sheriff's office representative, if I may, in addition to trying to maintain safe environments in our neighborhoods, uh, the sheriff continues, uh, continuously wants to work with uh, homeless coalitions. Hi, Diana and the county's hot team to identify those who are suffering from poverty and homelessness and refer them to organizations that help them raise themselves to self-sufficiency. 
In addition, we'll continue to work with other organizations like the Lord's Place on issues of poverty and homelessness and the reentry for state and local inmates who are being released. Because if we find that if they don't uh, find a better way, another way, then they'll return back, they'll recidivate and end back in prison. And that just leads to homelessness, not just for them, but for their families as well. We want to continue to embrace and fund other programs with our LETF funds uh, to help stabilize uh, victims of addiction and mental health. And lastly, we want to continue to hold those accountable who victimize the homeless and hungry at all levels, particularly what we're seeing with fraud. And if you remember, we just recently arrested some gentlemen who had committed well over $2 million in fraud in the food stamp program. Hopefully redirecting those funds into programs that help those in poverty become self-sustaining. So, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for what you do. Mike is involved with so much in the community and to make things work better. And, and he really works for, our, for us at that sheriff's office. And I'd like to recognize uh, Bob Burdish, too, with Legal Aid, because he's really uh, an angel for a lot of things we sit over there. So thank you, Bob, for what you do. At this time, uh, I think we've already done the call to action. And I know um, you know what I was talking about, so we can work on that. But we have some certificates, because we want to thank our panelists for what they coming out and, tonight. And Rep, uh, Representative Pafford, I don't know if he's still here. He might have left. Uh, Dr. Harvey, is he still here? You, you guys can just line up here. Perry Borch. <laughs> Dr. Robinson. Diana Stanley. Uh, Brian, uh, we have one for you too, and Verona Matthews, would you come up? Yeah. <laughs> we just like to thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Verona Matthews. Tonight, we really want to pay, um, <clears throat> say thank you to one of our um, former commissioners. Because this is what happened when I have so much stuff up here. I think somebody moved it. <laughs> uh -oh. We want to honor Maud Ford Lee, who is here in town. Uh, Maud <coughs> was our first African American uh, commissioner, county commissioner. Uh, and Maud Lee was a former wife of the late Percy H. Lee, uh, the Urban League's first executive director. She's the mother of two daughters, Deborah and Vanessa, grandmother of six, great grandmother of four, and foster grandmother of two. And she is a native of Tallahassee, Florida. 
From 1967, <clears throat> her professional career took root in Palm Beach County, leading the Community Action Program as it expanded from a small private nonprofit to a countywide public agency operating nine neighborhood service centers. In 1985, Maud was appointed as the Human Services Director overseeing all of the anti-poverty programs of the Community Action Program, as well as other divisions within Palm Beach County. In 1990, the constituents whom Maud had served for many years prodded her to run for public office, initially elected in 1990 and re-elected in 1992 and 1996. Maud Ford Lee held the historic positions of the, positions of the first African American American elected to the Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioners and chairperson of the board. Through her outstanding leadership and service in government, she has contributed positively to all the citizens of the county. Thank you, Maude, for what you've done. We have a certificate, and Maude knows about all these things with no, all of these. And so, yeah. <laughs> <Don't read that. laughs> and we have a proclamation. Uh, so this is just to show that we love you, we miss you, and we just welcome you back here today. And just, if you want to say a couple of words. Okay, thank you. Mayor uh, and Mr. Green, uh, it's a delight for me to hear that community action is still on the move. Um, it's, uh, it's very, my question didn't get asked. <laughs> you know, I get really worried. Uh, we've, we've done all of the work. The Community Action Program did all of the research on poverty and we had a plan. Uh, I, I began with the agency in 67 in the county, and uh, we, we had about four or five staff people in an administrative office. And uh, when we learned what the program should be doing, you know, we came back and we spread the word, and all of the people in the target areas, we call them target areas. I understand now we call them, what, the poor areas in the county? We still call them, we still call them target, target areas. areas. <laughs> well, anyway, we started with 11 target areas and all of the people wanted uh, a piece of the action. So that's how we began in 11 target areas. We began in churches and and, and center, neighborhood centers, and now we, we grew up and had centers built, and uh, that's how progress is made. So I'm delighted to see that we are still making progress, and we need community action in the county's plan to help eliminate poverty. And I'll be checking with you to see <laughs> how we can ensure that we get that uh, instituted in our county plan. Thank you. Thank you, Maude. And we will work on that. I saw John Van Arnold, but I guess he's left, but I'm sure that's something that we will work on. Uh, we're gonna recognize our county staff that's here tonight before we move on. And I see Lisa. Anybody else here with you, Lisa? Our camera people who's here. I think they're. Okay, I don't see. Yeah, it's channel 20. So I guess this is televised. It's going to be available on the website. It will be on the website, so you can see it. Uh, I think you had a very good program, James. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. And I'll turn the program over to you. <clears throat> I would just like to take a moment to thank all of our strategic partners for coming out tonight, uh, for Children's Services Council, Extended Hands, uh, the Office of Community Revitalization, Florida Health of Palm Beach County, 
Palm Beach County Food Bank, Legal Aid Society, United Way, the Healthcare District, School District, Human Services Coalition, 211 Lakeside Medical, Cross Ministries, the Palm Beach County Housing Authority, FAU, Family Central, Stand Down, Care, Caregiving Youth, the Glades Initiative, Goodwill, Gulfstream uh, Industries, Pathways to Prosperity, uh, the Career Source of Palm Beach County, the Bridges, the Lord's Place, the Urban League of Palm Beach County, and I, I don't think I said circles, but if I didn't, I'm gonna say it again. Um, and, and there are other strategic partners that are here tonight that are not listed on our program. We just wanna thank you for really coming out and listening and having this meaningful dialogue around poverty. We really believe this is gonna set the stage for us to move forward in a more strategic way. Um, it's important for us to be strategic in our approach, and I think that we have the mechanism to do, for, do so. Uh, as strategic partners, we will be calling on you to participate in focus groups. Uh, Julie uh, Swindler, who's, who's the president of the Nonprofits Chamber, has already agreed uh, to sit down with us and to get everyone together to do a focus group and to start looking at issues related to poverty and to do a comprehensive uh, needs assessment so that we can identify uh, those gaps and start targeting our approach a lot better. So we, again, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, for our community action staff, if you would just stand, I want to recognize you. <clears throat> thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, David, David and Chanel, where's David? Oh, there he is back there. <laughs> thank you, uh, David, who, who um, has really worked hard to uh, you know, help me plan this event. And then for all of our other divisions, for Claudia, and uh, Faith, who's not here, but Maggie was here uh, in her place. Thank you guys for coming out and supporting us this evening. We really want to continue to work together to break down these barriers and to, to, uh, to deal with these issues of poverty. And last but not least, I want to thank our county mayor, uh, Priscilla Taylor. We have an award here for you. Uh, really appreciate your leadership and, and moving things forward. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about collective impact and about our strategic approach, you know, without that, le that leadership present, it it's going to make it difficult for us to do anything, get anything done. So I'm very confident with, with your leadership and with the strength of our uh, strategic partners here that we can come up with a solution and start addressing these issues of poverty and, and be successful in doing so. So thank you so very much uh, for coming out. All right, that concludes our program. Um, thank you guys. We have a couple of things that we still have some food out there. So if you would take some food on your way out, we really appreciate that. And we'll be sending out a survey to really get your feedback and input on this, this symposium. Thank you. <laughs>